previously on Balls. Look who's popped up on our Skype. Hey, Robbie. Oh, and one, and one and only oh, Robert yeah. Hunter joining us here on uh, Balls Visual Radio. How's it going, Rob? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, obviously back home at the moment. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, better Take than a few days ago, that's for sure. All right. All right. Just to cheer you up, I know you'd rather be uh, climbing the... Where would you have been going? To the Pyrenees now, the Alps? Well, right now I would be going to the Alps. But, I mean, today being a rest, I wouldn't be doing too much like I'm doing now. So. All right. There we go. Just to cheer you up. You just miss bikini weather. This is Tegan. There we go. Hello, Tegan. All right. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Tegan. Uh, right, so uh, now that we've got a smile on your face, yeah, commiserations, man. And uh, we spoke to Phil Liggett just a short while ago. What a what a bizarre tour this year so far. Yeah, the first week obviously been a, a bit of a hectic tour. I mean, a lot of guys crashing, and uh, I mean, already quite a few guys. I mean, twenty odd guys already been sent home with uh, in a number of injuries. Uh, so yeah, it's been a bit of a bit of a strange tour so far. Yeah, and you had what you had two uh, two crashes in, in in your time on the tour. Uh, yeah, I had I had two crashes on the first day. You know, a real simple crash, but it wasn't uh, wasn't too pleasant. It was just, uh, you know we were cruising along after about ten k's, and there was a hole in the road that no one really saw, and I kind of hit the thing. And uh, where were you in Joburg? Like, Say again. Where were you in Joburg? <laughs> yeah, seems like it. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was that was. You know, pretty unpredictable whatever the case is, and you know, it just happened, but that uh, was no one's fault. And then, yeah, the second one, um, again, it's just uh, coming into the finish of one of, of things was stage four, and uh, um, one of the guys kind of got too close to someone else and uh, came down, and his bike came flying out of the group and took me down out of, out of the middle of nowhere. So that also wasn't too pleasant, since we were going close on 70 k's an hour, and mm. that's that's where I did quite a bit of damage to myself, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, that was the. That was a that was a crash that kind of put me in the situation where I am now, and you know I couldn't continue racing. How are you now? Well, I mean, you're looking you're looking fine, you're looking fit, and everything. We don't see any scratches or anything on the face, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> luckily, I mean, I actually for for going as fast as I came came off pretty pretty lightly. I mean, I, I managed to keep most of my skin, um, funnily enough, and then uh, I just hurt my back rather seriously. I mean, I got a, a small stress fracture in, in in one of the one of the vertebrae, and. Uh, Ouch. And quite a bit of bruising around uh, around two vertebrae that, that made life a little bit unpleasant. And uh, obviously, I did carry on racing for an extra two days thereafter. And uh, I just got to the point where um, there was almost no point in me carrying on. You know, it wasn't it wasn't injured. It's not an injury that was going to go away by by racing. Um, it needed time off a bike, and uh, and you know, it's a decision we came to. Unfortunately, you know, I did try and carry on, but uh, you know, I made the decision because there really was no point in carrying on. Mm. Just trying to scrape through the tour and, and doing more more damage than any, anything else. And look, I mean, that's a, that's a lottery. You just don't know when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. It all depends on where you are in that time. It's either you, you're you going to get caught up in it or you're going to avoid it. It's, uh, some of the, and I mean, you you follow the tweets and the riders that do and the riders that don't. Uh, and you can, you know, you almost feel for the riders or you do feel for the riders that don't because it's just bad, wrong place, wrong time. No, well, that's exactly what it is. I mean, you know, unfortunately, when you've got 200 guys, you know, racing and, uh, you know, somewhere along the line, someone crashes for whatever reason, someone else is going to be taken out. I mean, you know, a couple of guys ahead of them managed to say, yeah, you know, we, it happened behind us. A couple of guys who are further back say it happened just in front of us. You know, they, they're the kind of, or they're the guys you get away with and say, you know, we just missed it. But uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, the two times that I came down, once was, I wouldn't say I was the instigator, but I was the first guy to crash and took other guys down. And I was lucky enough in the first crash that, you know, nothing happened to me. But, I mean, the other guys who crashed with me ended up with... Uh, you know, broken wrists and those kinds of things. So um, that was pretty unlucky for them. And then in the second crash, you know, uh, I came down, hurt myself, but, you know, a couple of the other guys who came down managed to get away with it uh, um, relatively unscathed. And, you know, some of the other crashes that happened um, that I managed just to miss because uh, I was kind of hanging at the back of back of the group trying to get away with uh, riding with a hurt back, um, you know, one of the biggest crashes that happened until now where guys walked away with, you know, a couple more broken bones and, and ribs and punctured lungs and those kinds of things. And, you know, I was lucky enough, you know, that I was sitting right at the back of the group trying to stay out of all the trouble and I managed mm. to miss that as well. So, um, you know, with a bit of damage I've done to myself, I'm kind of happy that nothing nothing more has happened. Well, nothing more serious than uh, than that. What, how, how, what is the word? Not congenial, how convivial, how... How pleasant are the riders afterwards? I mean, can, tell us what it's like in the aftermath of a crash. Everyone else carries on. The guys avoid you. They carry on. So there's a group of you left behind, bikes all over the place. 
Yeah, uh, well, do they of, turn uh, on you or is it kind of style? You know, <laughs> do they all turn on you? <laughs> it depends on, on who's caused the crash. I mean, uh, if uh, if someone's done something really stupid and and they brought down a bunch of guys, it's uh, someone inevitably stands up and starts screaming and shouting and wants to smash a bike or a wheel over someone else's head. But Normally I mean, the French, I, right? Uh, yeah, normally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but normally, I mean, it's uh, a lot of the time things happen and it's no one's fault. And, you know, you kind of get up and scrape yourself together and, you know, try and get on with the job. But, I mean, um, you know, there's other times where guys are lying there and even if it was someone else's fault, they can't do anything about it because they've got a couple of broken ribs themselves. So, mm. um, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's always, there's always times where some guys have done something really stupid and, you know, the guys... The guys do get in their faces and tell them, you know, they need to be a lot more careful. And uh, I've seen a few more choiceful words, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's never a fun thing coming off a bicycle where you've just covered in basically lycra and go and meet, go, go meet yourself uh, or go find yourself lying on, uh, yeah. on a bit of asphalt. No, no one, you know, it would be crazy to do that on purpose. Uh, <laughs> all right, so, uh, as we say, sadly uh, not part of the tour anymore. Uh, also looked like a, a tough day for, for Daryl. Um, I think he was lying somewhere in the, around the 50s, thereabouts. Um, but I think in like 24, to a day or two days, he's now dropped out to sort of down uh, below 100th place. What, what yeah. happened with him? Are you still in touch with him? Well, I'm still in touch with him daily. And uh, Daryl, again, is not really a, a classification rider. He's more of a guy who's, I think, from you know from this next week and the third week, he'll be looking to try and you know notch up the stage. Mm. Um, he's, not a, he's not one of the best climbers in the world, but he's one of the fastest guys out there. So... Um, obviously, until now, he's been working for um, his team leader, um, Goss, uh, the Australian rider. So he's got his work cut out for him, but there's, he, he's climbing really well at the moment compared to 99% of the other sprinters out there. So um, I'm guessing that you know in the second or third week, there's going to be a hard enough day that he'll be able to get to the finish where um, a lot of guys won't. Uh, and you'll, you'll have a good chance at trying to get a stage this year, I'm sure. All right. We had a chat to Phil just a moment ago, just to sort of set the scene coming out of rest day into the, the next phase. And obviously, we start uh, seeing all the climbs and stuff like that. Brad yeah. Wiggins out in front. Uh, he was saying that uh, he's pretty much well teed up for, uh, uh, you know, to go and win the thing. Cadal Evans has got some work to do. And then we see Chris Froome lurking back, what, in third, uh, third spot, also with a shot at winning it. But there's the whole team orders uh, thing that comes into it where... He was saying, yeah, um, basically, um, you know, Froome has uh, been told, okay, Bradley Wiggins the boy, you just got to behave as part of the team. Well, I think so. I mean, he was the, the, the same thing was said last year in, uh, in the Tour of Spain when, uh, uh, again, Wiggins was the leader, Froome was there to help, and it ended up that Froome finished second, um, and Wiggins ended up cracking. And I think, uh, I, think that, I think a lot of people are silly to discount Froome because... Uh, in my opinion, he's a better tour racer than, or three-week racer than, uh, than what Wiggins is. I think in the third week, in the climbs more specifically, he'll be a lot stronger than, than Wiggins. And uh, if things go well, I think that uh, there could be a big possibility that one of the big stages where maybe some of the other riders are, are attacking um, and, and, and Wiggins finds himself kind of a little bit on the back foot. And if uh, if Room follows, there might be a situation where you know he gets a gap on, not that, not that he won to but if he ends up following you know someone else's attack then and, and gets up uh, a bit of time up the road i don't think the, the, the team's going to say to him hey listen hold back um especially if at that point in time he is the strongest rider i think down the line they'd really prefer if wiggins wins but if room wins i don't think they're gonna you know uh, be mm. too unhappy about it so, so, so if I that does if that does happen then and he sees the gap and he goes for it i mean would mm -hmm. there be any kind of pre sort of now okay this is the way it's going from now onwards uh, this is what you guys do, and if, if he does see a gap and go for it, it's not like his team are going to be pissed off with him. Uh, no, I think it. they'll be upset with him, especially I mean, if he goes out and starts attacking his own teammate, then it's a whole different ball game. Then, yes, they're going to be upset with the guy and say, listen, be fun you know, to watch. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, um, but I think if, if it ends up being in a situation where he follows a group of riders and Wiggins can't follow, um, let's say call it Cadell Evans, where yeah. Cadell rides away, Wiggins can't follow, and Froome is up there. To protect, you know, to try and make sure they've got someone up there and mm. Froome follows, they're not going to say, listen, hang back and go and help Wiggins because um, that's, you know, just going to end up buggering up the whole situation. So I think that uh, Froome's sitting in a really good situation. Obviously, he uh, he lost two minutes on, on the very first road stage uh, due to a puncture. If he hadn't have done that, he would have only been a few seconds behind Wiggins right now. Yeah. So um, I think uh, sometimes it's a bad thing that he 
the last of two minutes sometimes is a good thing because you know, it puts him in a situation where definitely in the second and third week, if something goes away and he's, you know, gets a minute, um, it definitely plays into the hands where he can say, listen, I don't have to do anything, get out and have to chase. And, you know, it puts him in a situation where, you know, he can then definitely ride for, for winning the Tour de France. And, uh, you know, I said five years ago when, when I actually helped him uh, turn pro that he was going to be someone who was going to be um, definitely going to be a rider to win a Grand Tour uh, in, in the future. And, I mean, you can see it right now. In, within a year, he's finished second at the Tour of Spain. And, you know, he's lying third right now in the Tour de France, which is the hardest bike race in the world. And, uh, like I say, it's obviously still two weeks of racing coming, but I think he's going to be right up there. And um, if not uh, uh, if not finishing the podium, he might just be on the top of the podium. All right. So they're interesting and a slightly different view to it to uh, what Phil was telling us a little earlier on. The other thing we spoke about was looking further ahead in the M10 Quebec side. Uh, and that is um, how, how serious a, a possibility is a guy like Chris Froome for looking ahead to next year, get that side going, get that team going, that all-Africa team, particularly with his position. And, and as Phil was telling us, uh, there was a chance that Sky might not even have signed him uh, up to a point a, a little while ago. So uh, is, would he be one of the serious guys to join you guys in that team? Well, I mean, honestly, from what I know um, about Chris's contracts and those kinds of things, I think he is signed up for another two years. Oh, so really? okay. um, but I think in the future, I mean, if, 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 if MTN... Uh, are really serious, which it seems they are, by getting an African or, or, or you know, well, South African and all African team into the biggest uh, you know echelons in the world and biggest race in the world. There's no reason why they can't. Uh, the biggest the turn to the whole situation is money. Um, you know, they've got a reason. They should have a reasonable budget next year, but it's still probably a half uh, of what teams like um, Garmin and probably less than half of what teams like Sky have got. So um, it's, it's not that they can't get the riders. It's simply a fact of a lot of riders out there, a guy like Froome, for instance, you know, in the future is going to be earning, um, you know, one and a half million euros a year. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that's a lot of money, whereas uh, a, a team like MTN, you know, that's probably going to end up being, um, you know, close on a million and a half euros, we're probably close on a third of their budget. So one rider taking up a third of a, a team's budget is not an easy thing to do, especially when you're trying to get uh, 25 riders t- together. So mm. it's, uh, money, is, money is the thing of the day, especially when you're trying to get a team to, to race the Tour de France. All right, what kind of money are they talking about? Um, you've got to look at, obviously, you know, sustainability as well. You don't want to suddenly you know, have, this, have this, uh, this pitch, have this all-African side or this yeah. team. Uh, and then after a year, they disappear because it's just it's just going to be costing far too much to sustain it and keep it going over year after year. Well, definitely. I mean, I think if you're looking at the biggest teams in the world, the kind of money that it's that's involved in the whole thing, you're probably looking at about 10 million euros to, to have a team uh, on, wow. on the best level in the world um, in, uh, with the best riders, knowing that you're going to get a return on basically your marketing in the sense that uh, if you're going to go to the Tour de France, obviously you have to buy some of the best riders, which cost money. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same thing happens, uh, you know, in, on this, or in the same, in the same breath, you got to say that, you know, you never guarantee the results. But if you go to the Tour de France, you do get results. The amount of money that you can get on, on a return, you know, marketing-wise, for your 10 million euros, could run into the a billion rand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I remember figures from when we were with World, you know, the budget was only, I think, on about 50 million rand per year, which is kind of the same kind of budget MTN is looking at right now. But, um, you know, the, the Tour de France that we really rode well at, uh, if I remember right, it was close on a billion rand's worth of marketing uh, that came back, you know, to them. So it's, uh, the, the, the reward that they can get is huge. It far outweighs the money that they spend, yeah. um, if that's what, it's, you know, MTN and them are looking for. All right. Well, obviously, that's uh, way in the future for now. Tour de France, uh, still a little way to go. So we'll keep an eye on uh, on what's happening there. And, uh, Rob, I do believe you are blogging and uh, doing a whole lot of stuff Well, now that you're sort of not active on the bike. Uh, Just tell us a bit about that and where people can see your daily thoughts. Yeah, obviously, I just do a little uh, little blog every day at the end of every stage once I watch it on TV and, you know, heard from a couple of guys who are in the race and, you know, what their thoughts are. And, uh, I've got a little, uh, like I said, a little blog going every day. It goes out probably about half an hour, an hour after, hour after the stage on, on the Helivac uh, WordPress site. And, um, yeah, they've been, they've been kind enough to, you know, to want to get a bit more to, of, of the Tour de France to, you know, some of the local guys back in South Africa. So I give my points of view uh, every day and, uh, you know, a bit of, bit of Twitter as well. And, yeah, they, you know, it keeps, it keeps the locals back in South Africa who's sitting in an office, uh, 
um, you know, behind a desk, you know, can kind of keep up to date instead of, uh, you know, watching the Tour de France live every day. Yeah, cool. Well, there it is. And uh, you can find that on, uh, what, the Helivac uh, website? Yeah, the Helivac WordPress website, yeah. Helivac WordPress, okay, cool. If you want to see what uh, Rob's thoughts are daily after each uh, stage of the Tour de France, it's been a rest day for all the riders today, and uh, yeah, Rob's looking pretty restful. We, we always know our cue when we need to wrap it up when uh, the family come popping in and say, mm-hmm. right, Daddy, we need you, so. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Nice to Go chat to you as always, Thank Rob. You, Rob. Best look after yourself, and I hope that back uh, gets better soon, okay? Thanks, guys. Cheers, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. There we go. Robbie Hunter joining us from his home in Switzerland uh, talking about Tour de France. So a thorough look at where we are with rest day. We the best on three. One, two, three. We the best. 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Mondays to Fridays live on balls.co.za. Balls.co.za.